Uh, this, this morning, we are going to look at a little book in our Old Testament that we're probably all very, pretty familiar with. It's only four chapters long. Uh, and while we could do a whole series of lessons on this book very easily, I'm going to attempt to cover the entire book in one sermon. Uh, and my goal is not to make every practical point that I possibly could. My goal is just to give you the one main message of the book. Why is it in our Bible? And, and the book is the book of Jonah. Now, this might seem a little funny on the slide. I, I named him the Upside Down Prophet. Because in Jonah, it, it's, it's not like any of the other prophets that we read about. There are some weird things going on in the book of Jonah. He, he, he's, he's an odd character. There's weird things happening. It's, it's kind of like Ricky coming to services with tennis shoes on. It just doesn't make sense. And so we're going to try to figure out what's going on in this Upside Down World of Jonah. Uh, and a couple things before we jump into the text. Number one, we are not talking about a parable this morning. We are not talking about an allegory. Uh, and if you want to argue that, that's fine. You just won't be arguing with me. You'll be arguing with Jesus. Because in Matthew 12 and Luke 11, Jesus made it very clear that Jonah is an historical account. So we're talking about history this morning. And it's not just a kid's story. Uh, not that we shouldn't tell it to our kids. We should. But, but there are really some, some deep things in Jonah. No pun intended. It, there's some important things for us to learn. It's a, it's a serious book. Uh, and I also want us to realize that there's some complexity to Jonah. It's just four chapters long. It's pretty short. We probably think we already understand what's going on there, but, but the literature is pretty complex. There's a lot of interesting structure, uh, allusions to the Old Testament. It's, it's pretty complex. And, and the final thing I want to point out is that we need to appreciate the style of Jonah. Because I think it's very clear that Jonah is written in a style of satire. Meaning a story written to, to show us just this uh, just incredible character with, with irony and comedy and hyperbole to get us to see that, that something is wrong with that character and we should kind of look at ourselves to make sure that we're not the same. And so just a word about Jonah himself here. I, I do believe that Jonah wrote this book. And if that is the case, then he is writing from a place where he has got it together. He's repented. He's in a place of redemption. And I think we should look at Jonah the man in a good light because of that. However, when we look at the book itself, I do not think we should have a positive light of Jonah. I think that's kind of the whole point, that we should have a negative outlook on his actions. Most people kind of think of the story of Jonah kind of being up and down like this. He kind of does some good, does some bad, does some good. Uh, I tend to look at it more like this. <laughs> I think it's really just a downward slope. I'm pretty hard on Jonah in the story. Uh, I think he starts at a place and he continues to downslide the whole way. But we'll, we'll see that as we go. So let, let's jump into to verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. So now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, we don't have anything that's necessarily upside down yet in verses 1 and 2. However, we do have something that's unique, because we have the call of the prophet, which is pretty normal, but he's going somewhere that's not normal. He's not going to prophesy to the nation of Israel. He's going to prophesy to Nineveh, the nation of Assyria. An enemy nation. And quickly, I think we need to appreciate, to really understand the story, just how terrible the Assyrians were. They were an extremely wicked, extremely evil nation. Uh, they, they were a world power, and they did that by, by military conquest, just like all the world powers. Uh, however, they had a little different recipe of breaking down revolts and keeping peace. Uh, unlike the Romans and the Greeks who were trying to kind of be your friend and letting you kind of do your own thing as long as you just pay homage to us, uh, that's kind of how they kept peace, just, just like us. The Assyrians were on the other end of the spectrum. They were terrible, and they wanted you to fear them, and that's why you wouldn't revolt. And so they would, like dismember bodies and skin people alive and put people on stakes for fun. Uh, I don't make this analogy lightly. Uh, the analogy has been made between Assyria and Nazi Germany. And honestly, from what I've read, I don't think Nazi Germany holds a candle to Assyria. They, they are wicked people, terrible people. And this is who Jonah is told to go and prophesy to. Uh, and another thing about Jonah himself that we should understand before we jump into the story, there's one other story about Jonah in our scriptures. It's in 2 Kings chapter 14. It's where he prophesies to King Jeroboam II. Uh, and it's kind of odd because he prophesies blessings on him of how the nation's borders are going to expand. However, we know Jeroboam II is an evil king. So it seems a little bit weird already off the top. And we see Jonah prophesying blessings onto someone that does not deserve it. Just keep that in your back pocket. Verse 3. It says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, this, this is upside down. <laughs> we have a prophet running away from the call that God gave him. Now, some prophets kind of tiptoe and have to be brought along, but Jonah just completely runs away. Now, I don't have a map for you this morning, but he was supposed to go to Nineveh, north and east, pretty far away from Israel, and he goes to Tarshish, which is literally as far west in his known world that he could go of that day, literally as far away as he could away from Nineveh. That's, that's where he goes, to the other end of the world. He really does not want to go to Nineveh. So you have a prophet running away from God. This, this is upside down stuff. And this starts a motif that I like to call Jonah as the pagan. Because Jonah is a prophet, and he knows good and well that he cannot escape the presence of the Lord. He knows that God is omnipresent. However, the, the pagan nations, they viewed God as territorial. There's a God over Egypt, and there's a God over Assyria, and there's a God over Israel. And if you want to rafe, run away from that God, you just, you just leave that territory. You, you can get away from them. Uh, and that's exactly what we find Jonah acting like, that he can flee from the presence of God. This is, this is very weird. This is upside down world. And then in verses 4 through 6, we see that God doesn't like this idea, and so he throws a storm upon the ship that Jonah is on. And it's not just a normal storm. This is a really bad, dangerous storm. And, and the, the sailors in the boat just begin dumping the cargo. That, that's their livelihood. That's money. They're just throwing dollar bills in the water. So this is a life and death situation. And we even get this idea that the boat is threatening to break up. And we're supposed to kind of laugh at that because the author is actually personifying the boat. Like the boat is even saying, hey, guys, we need to do something here. I'm going to break apart. <laughs> and so we have the sailors recognizing that the storm is a problem. And we have the boat itself recognizing that the storm is a problem. But yet, where do we find Jonah? He's sleeping. This isn't just a little cat nap. This is a deep sleep, the same word that's used for Adam's sleep. He's asleep in the middle of God's storm. He's asleep to God's judgment. This does not make any sense. This is upside down world. And it actually takes one of the sailors to wake him up. And then in verses six or seven through 10, rather, we find some more interesting things uh, because the sailors want to figure out whose God is responsible for this. Uh, and so they cast lots, and the lot ends up falling upon Jonah. And so they ask Jonah, well, what's going on here? Why is your God angry at us? What's happening? Uh, and Jonah, and they end up questioning all, all these different questions. Where are you from? Who's your God? What's, who's your family? All these things, ganging up on Jonah. And Jonah finally answers, I am a Hebrew. And I serve the God of heaven that made the sea and the land. And that got their attention. Because another pagan thought of their gods was not just that they were territorial, but they had certain powers over certain things. There's a God over the sun, a God over water, a God over the mountains. But Jonah says, no, I serve the God that made the sea and that made the land. And that got their attention. And they become very afraid and they begin to continue to pray and try to run away from the storm. But, but it's no use. It's no use. And so finally they asked Jonah, what, what do we do to appease your God? How, how do we make your God not be angry anymore? And Jonah says, I want you to kill me. I want you to throw me in. Throw me into the water. Now, I, I want to suggest to you that we shouldn't view this as a noble task for a few reasons. Number one, it's interesting why Jonah doesn't just jump into the water himself. You ever thought about that? He asked for the sailors to throw him in. He's trying to commit suicide by sailor. And Jonah knows good and well that Yahweh does not accept human sacrifice. In fact, he commands against it. In contrast, the pagan gods are very happy with human sacrifice. They're all about it. That's how they appease their gods. That's actually a normal practice. However, what do we find the sailors saying to Jonah? They say, no, we don't want to do it. We don't want this innocent blood upon us. And so they try, again, to outrun the storm, but they can't. And so finally, finally, they acquiesce to Jonah's request, and they throw Jonah in to the sea. And then we also find something really weird going on, because the sailors then make vows, and they make sacrifices, not just to a nebulous God, they make it to Yahweh. They, they are worshiping Yahweh. This is totally upside down world. The sailors are acting like the prophet, and the prophet is acting like the pagans. And we see that the, sh the sailors don't just give words. They don't just say things and give lip service. They're actually doing things versus Jonah, who's, who said, I fear this God, but he's, he's not acting like it at all. And then, of course, at the end of chapter 1, in verse 17, it says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish, and if you have questions about that, you can ask 
Jordan. Now we're going to move on to chapter 2. Uh, so, so Jonah is in the belly of this fish, okay? Uh, and in chapter 2, we get his prayer. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have, I have wrestled with and struggled with this prayer for the past week or so. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you two different views of how we can view this prayer. Uh, and luckily, I don't think it changes the main message of the story at all. Uh, and, and before we get those two views, I want us just to appreciate that this prayer is really pretty impressive. It, it's kind of amazing, the prayer that Jonah gives. I mean, I mean, it's poetry, and it's elegant, and it's got all these psalms interweaved in it. And don't have the picture of Jonah in like this big room with a table and a, a pen and quill, you know, the parchment. No, no, he's in like a tuna straitjacket. And while he's in that, he, he makes this amazing prayer. It's amazing. So view number one. View number one is that this prayer is a true prayer of repentance. That Jonah really, he hits rock bottom, he figures out his problem, he totally turns from it, he decides, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. That's view number one. And there's some reasons to think that. He talks about how the Lord has remembered him. He talks about how he's, he's looked up into the temple and how his prayer is entered into the temple. He's talked about how salvation belongs to the Lord and how he is going to make vows and sacrifices. So perhaps this is a real, true prayer of repentance. However, I have become increasingly convinced of option number two, which is that this, while, while this is a pious prayer, and it's a prayer of absolute thankfulness, it, it's not true repentance. I think it's at best maybe shallow repentance. And there's a few reasons for this. Reason number one, there's something very interesting missing from this prayer. Jonah never confesses any sin. He never apologizes. He never says, I'm sorry for not going to Nineveh. I'm sorry for how I've acted. He never says anything about what he's done wrong. And that's very unique to prayers in Scripture. Uh, number two, the actual word for repentance, the, the word in Hebrew that typically gets translated repentance, uh, shub, it means just to turn. We have the idea of repenting to turn from something. That's where we get that from. That word is not found in the prayer anywhere. And you might say, okay, that's not really that big a deal. He's talking about images that could refer to repentance. However, when we um, appreciate that the word is used elsewhere, it becomes seemingly significant. Because the sailors in this story are told that we are told that they turn. They, they try to, to turn back from the storm. And so the idea of repentance is there. And the Ninevites, we're going to see, they turn from their wickedness. So there's this idea of repentance there. And even God himself in chapter 3 turns from his anger. So we find every character in the story repenting, turning, except for Jonah. It's interesting. Also, we're going to see how his actions afterward, I'm going to suggest, don't necessarily show us that he had a heart of true repentance at this point. And again, this motif of how he gives words, but maybe he doesn't really act them out because he says, I'm going to make vows and sacrifices, yet we never see him do that in the story. Unlike the sailors, who we do find doing just that. They actually made vows, and they actually made sacrifices. And, and just one last thing to, to point on this prayer, if I haven't convinced you yet. Uh, he, he talks about, in, in his worst place, in the belly of this fish, during this, this prayer of repentance, he manages to say something, a little gouge, at his enemies. In verse 8 of chapter 2, he says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. So while he's in the depths of the sea in a fish, he, he finds the time during this prayer to kind of make a shot at, at the pagans. And I think, no doubt, he had in his mind those sailors from chapter 1. Now keep in mind, he had no idea what the sailors did after he was thrown into the sea. He had no idea that they actually started to worship Yahweh. And in his mind, he probably thought, Yahweh's just another god on the pile. As soon as the storm ends and they get to dry land, they're going to forget all about Yahweh. They just regard vain idols. However, it's the sailors that we see worshiping Yahweh, and it's Jonah that we see not actually making sacrifices. This is, this is upside-down world, I think. And then, and then we get to, to chapter 3. After we see that Jonah is vomited back up on the land, uh, he, he gets out of the fish, and now we kind of hit the reset button. Uh, and you might have a little bit of deja vu, because God comes back to him with just the same exact call. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, but this time he goes. He goes to Nineveh. However, again, again, I want us to be careful about giving him too much praise maybe for going to Nineveh, because I think this is a begruntled prophet going to Nineveh. To praise him for making vows, to praise him for making sacrifices, to praise him for a pilgrimage to Nineveh is kind of missing the point, I think, because all of those things are going to be meaningless if he does not embrace God's character of mercy. And I think that's the point of the story, because we see some interesting things happen when he gets to the city. We're, we're told that it's a three days walk. And Jonah just walks in one day. He only goes like a third of the way in. And then his, 
his sermon's kind of weird. He does something that, that we probably wish uh, myself and Ricky and Jordan would do. Uh, he just gives a five-word sermon. Uh, that's it. Five words in Hebrew, eight, eight words in your English uh, version. Uh, just five words. All he says, he goes into the city and he just says, you're all going to die later. Judgment. See ya. That's all he says. It's over. He gives them no message about who the God is that's bringing the judgment, why the judgment is coming, why, what they should do about it. He just says, you're going to die. And then he leaves. That, that's the whole message. That's it. But then we see, and again, this is upside down world even in that aspect, because the other prophets that we see, their, their prophecies and their sermons are flowery and amazing and elegant. Even the prayer that he had in the fish was better than the, the sermon that he preached in Nineveh. And then something really crazy happens. The Ninevites repent. This wicked city of Nineveh, the, the capital city of Assyria, the most wicked people on the earth, they completely repent. And it's not just like a little bit of repentance. It's like the little kid in the back seat when you're going on vacation and the kid keeps asking their parents, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I, that's kind of how I envision the repentance going. Like, like oh, we've have you guys repented yet? Have you repented? Has the king repented yet? Have the animals repented yet? The cows? I mean, that's what's going on. The king repents. Even the animals are putting on sackcloth and ashes. Everyone completely repents. Nineveh, it's completely upside down world. And in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3, we see the reason for that. Even though Jonah didn't tell them about his God, they, they just wonder. They wonder, maybe this God is a merciful God. And so they turn from their wicked ways. And then chapter 4, we get the climax of the story. Because Jonah has just... He's, he's just helped Nineveh repent. The most wicked city in the world, the most wicked man in the world, and the king. And you would think he would be happy about that. You'd think he'd be going back to Israel kind of with a notch on his belt. Like, guys, I, I know you don't believe this, but I actually got the entire city to repent, I promise. I, I even got a signed note. I mean, I did it. You would think he would be happy about it. But remember what world we're in. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And again, we get, we get more irony. As soon as God turns from his anger, Jonah gets angry. Uh, and we get a second prayer, and it's not a prayer of thankfulness at all. And we finally get the reason for why Jonah is running. It's not because he's scared of Nineveh. He, he's not worrying about being tortured by the Assyrians. He runs because God is merciful. He runs because God is gracious. He runs because God is loving. Jonah's sitting here angry, calling God a dirty forgiver. This is totally upside down world. What is going on in Jonah's world? And then he asked to die. And we see every other character in the story, the sailors saying, don't let us perish. We want to live. The Ninevites, we don't want to perish. We want to live. And here's Jonah asking to die. And here we see that even though he's not in the bottom of the sea anymore, he's in his lowest place yet. Because he's no longer asking sailors to kill him. He's asking God to kill him. And when God kills you, even a fish isn't going to help you out. Jonah is in his lowest point, rather dying than living in a world where the Ninevites could be forgiven. We have a word for that it's called hatred. Jonah hates the Ninevites. But notice God's response. God has made people into a greasy spot for a whole lot less than what Jonah's done in the story. But notice how he responds to him. It, he's gentle. He, just, he asks him a question. He just asks him a question in verse 4. Do you do well to be angry? And it's interesting because Jonah doesn't answer it this time. He's going to ask it again. But there's no response. We just continue with the story. Verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was fainting. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? He said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. 
And the Lord said, You pity the plant, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Jonah is sitting outside the city hoping that Nineveh is going to repent of its repentance. He's hoping at day 40 the clock's going to tick and God's going to rain down some fire on these Ninevites. He does not want them to be saved. And then there's this odd story about how God is finally going to get to him. It's not through a big storm or a big fish. It's through this plant and a little worm. Uh, because apparently camping worked the same way back then as it does now. Uh, when you're angry, you don't really set up a tent very well. And so, and so Jonah sets up this little tent, but it's not giving them very good shade. And so the Lord gives them a plant. He's nice. He gives them this big plant to give them some shade. And this is the first time we see Jonah being happy. This is the first time we read that he has joy because he's got this plant to give him some shade. But then the Lord takes it away. A little worm eats it. Some wind comes on Jonah. Now he's hot and bothered. And he's, he's really upset about this. Actually, He's so upset that he wants to die, and we're supposed to kind of laugh at this. Jonah gets his plant taken away, and he wants to die. Uh, and, then, and then God says something that just gets right at the heart of the book. He says, you cared about this plant so much, Jonah. Should I not care about Nineveh? Do you get what he's saying? Jo Jonah, it's just this, this random plant that popped up in a day. It's not like you planted the seed and cultivated it, and then it grew like a year later, and you brought it to show and tell, and it's your favorite plant, and then it dies. No, this is just a random plant, and you want to die over this plant. Should I not care even more about the city of Nineveh, people that are made in my image, 120,000 people? Should I not care more about them? Jonah says, I have a right to be angry, even to death. Jonah still is not getting it. And then God ask the question, and he gives a reason for why he has compassion on the Ninevites. He says they don't even know their right hand from their left. I am not convinced that this is talking about children. I think this is talking about the Ninevites not rowing the right way. Is God letting them off the hook? Absolutely not. The, the gun that God sent Jonah with was a loaded gun. There was a real judgment coming if they didn't repent. But he says they don't know their right hand from their left. They don't know their way. And the picture is this, that Jonah is a prophet of Israel, of God's people, and they were given the law. They were given the commandments. They knew who God was. Jonah knows exactly who God is. He can quote Psalms in the belly of a fish, and he knows exactly what God's character is like. Jonah knows God. The Ninevites do not. They have not been given the same privilege that Jonah has been given. And he says, should I not have compassion on even them? because they don't know their way. God is telling us that we need to see them as people that need to be taught. Oh, and then he says something about cows, and then the story's over. That's it. Upside down world. What, what is going on in the book of Jonah? What are we supposed to learn from this lesson? What is happening, and what are we supposed to take away from it? Well, I will, I will save you the expense, uh, the suspense, rather. Uh, the main message of this book is all about God's mercy. There are great big storms, there are great big fish, there are big plants, great big cities. The biggest of them all is God's mercy. We're supposed to see because God is such a merciful God that we should also have mercy on others, even those that we see as enemies. We should see people as God sees people. It's about God's mercy and how we should have mercy as well. Now, to, to kind of flesh that out, I want us to explore, number one, Jonah's struggle get a better understanding of this. You remember in the beginning of chapter 4, his argument against God, he says, the reason I fled is because I knew you were gracious and merciful and loving. And what Jonah is doing is he is quoting a very important Old Testament passage. It's kind of like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. If you like to hang up scriptures on your wall or on your car, this would be one to hang up. It's Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And what is going on is that God himself is describing who he is to Moses. And you might remember the story that got us there. Before that, God has brought Israel out of Egypt. He's redeemed them. And he brings them to Mount Sinai to enter into a covenant, essentially into a marriage with Yahweh. And the people agree to his commandments. They say, we're going to follow you. And the first two things they agreed to were no other gods and no idols. And the very first thing we see them do as soon as Moses goes back up on the mountain is building a golden calf. 
Israel is regarding vain idols. And the fact is, is they've done that throughout their history. And then you might remember what happens after that. Moses goes back up on the mountain, and God tells Moses what's going on, that they made an idol, and God says, I'm done. I'm already done with Israel. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. I'm done. And the only reason why God doesn't destroy Israel is because Moses intercedes for them. And here, again, is just amazing irony. <laughs> because Jonah is mad at God for his mercy. And the fact is that Jonah wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for God's mercy. Israel wouldn't exist if it wasn't for God's mercy. God's mercy is all over Israel's story, and it's all over Jonah's story. Because that's his character is the only reason why Jonah is there. But there's more interesting things to this. Jonah quotes verse 7 of Exodus 34, but he only quotes it halfway. He cuts it off short. Because after God tells Moses that he's merciful and gracious, he then goes on to tell Moses that he's also just. Because he says, I will by no means clear the guilty. But Jonah leaves that little detail out. He leaves out the part about God's justice. Why? Because Jonah thinks they are incompatible. Jonah doesn't think that God's mercy and his justice are compatible. That God's salvation and his judgment can work together. And again, the irony is slapping us in the face because the whole story is about how they are compatible. <laughs> what was the storm? Was it salvation or was it judgment? It was both. It was, it was supposed to correct Jonah, to bring him back and then serve as salvation. What was the fish? Salvation or judgment? It was both. It was meant to turn Jonah, to correct him, and also provide his salvation. And here's the really funny one. What, what about the story of Nineveh? Jonah only prophesies judgment. And what does it end up for Nineveh? Salvation. God is working salvation through judgment. He's trying to show Jonah that these are compatible. I am consistent. And now there, there's an aspect, we don't have time to really dig into it, uh, I, I think we should see that Jonah was missing the big picture here because he likely thought that the salvation of Nineveh was going to mean the destruction of Israel. They were neighbors, they were enemies, and Assyria was already coming into the land of Israel. So in Jonah's mind, if I save Nineveh, if I save Assyria, that means destruction of Israel. But the amazing thing is, is he had it totally backwards because Nineveh, Assyria, was this Israel's big fish. God was going to use them to help to turn Israel and eventually bring them back to salvation, the true Israel, after the exile. It's amazing, God's plans. But I don't think we should pick on Jonah for not getting the big picture. I really don't. I don't think that's what we're supposed to pick on him for. However, he's not validated in thinking that God is inconsistent. In thinking that God says he's a God of justice, but he's just all mercy. He's not keeping his word. He's not validated in that because of two really important reasons. Because number one, he knows who God is. He has his revelation. And number two, he's seen God's mercy in his own life. And because of those two things, he should have been able to overcome his misunderstanding of the bigger picture. And there's a lesson for us in that. We are not always going to understand God's plans. We're not going to always understand his purposes. And that can be our struggle today with God's mercy. We're not always going to recognize someone that God has put into our life, a person that maybe we see as an enemy. However, maybe that person is supposed to help mold us, to help turn us, to help us have a heart of compassion like our God has. Ezekiel 18.32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Do we wish for the death of anyone? Oh, we would never say it that way. But, but do we see someone that's very immoral, maybe somebody that's famous, and just think, I can't wait for them to get what's coming to them. Frankly, I'll be pretty happy when, when it does, when that happens. What are we saying? Are we wanting them to be lost for eternity? Do, do we see all people alike? Red, yellow, black, and white. The people we work with and the people on the street. Police officers and people that are bartenders. Uh, teachers at school and the people that run our country. Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Roman Catholics. Do we want all people to be saved as God wants all people to be saved? How about those that harm us personally? Well, you, don't have, you have no idea what they've done to me. 
And they weren't even sorry for it. They didn't even ask for forgiveness. And to be honest with you, I just kind of hope that they stay hardened because I don't even really want to receive them back. I don't want to forgive them. Do we want all people to come to repentance? Matthew 18 talks about how Peter comes to Jesus and he's asking him about forgiveness. And he thinks he's being noble when he asks, how many times should I forgive someone a day? Seven times in a day should I forgive somebody? And Jesus answers back, no, I tell you 70 times seven. The, the picture is you forgive someone as often as they ask it. And the, the lesson is this. As far as we want God to go with us, we should go with others. We should have the same compassion on other people that God has had on us. God's not asking us to do anything that he has not already done for us. Nothing he was asking Jonah was not something that he had already done for Jonah. And the fact is that we still have Ninevehs today in our life. People that God has put into our life that we like to view as enemies. But God is not leaving us the option of the mindset of having the us and them mentality. It's not us against them. And this can pop up everywhere. It pops up in politics. All those liberals, they're just, they're just tearing down the country. They're ruining everything. They are the problem. And then we, we get on social media and we talk about how terrible they are and we let everybody know. Or maybe it's the conservatives. They're the ones that are the real problem. They're messing everything up. We need to solve this issue of the, all these conservatives. And we tell everybody about it on social media. Do we give the impression that we want mercy on them? That we want those kind of people to come to repentance? Or do we see them as an enemy? How about in the workplace? Maybe you have a boss or a coworker that views you as a second-class citizen. Maybe it's because you don't go to the drinking parties on Saturday night with them. Maybe it's because uh, they ask you to fudge on the numbers and you say no, and now all of a sudden you're the enemy, and they just treat you that way, and you're kind of thinking in your mind, I really hope one day they get theirs. I hope there's justice for them. Do we have the right to be angry? and not have mercy as God has mercy on those people to hope that they come to repentance? Sometimes it's in the church. Maybe someone has done something to you, and you think, I am never going to forget. I'm, I'm never going to sit on the same side of the building with them anymore. I'm not going to forgive them. I really hope that they don't come around, because I, I want them to stay hardened, because I don't want to forgive. Or do we have the heart of compassion that our God does? Or do we view them as an enemy? Sometimes the enemy is in your home. Sometimes it's a spouse, or a parent, or a sibling. Are they our enemy? Do we hope that they, they don't come back, that, that we just don't want them to be family anymore? Or do we have the heart of compassion that our God has? Do we hope that they come to repentance? We have Nineveh's still today. It's not us against them. The question is, should we have compassion and mercy like our God on the people that we want to hate, the people that we want to be our enemies. So we, we know what the message is, but, but how do we improve? Uh, this will be short. How do we do what Jonah didn't do? How do we have mercy on those that we see as enemies? Enemies of our country? Enemies of Christianity? Enemies to us personally? I, I just have two points for you. They're, they're pretty short. And they come straight from the story. Number one, we need to have the eyes that God has of compassion and see people as people that need to be taught, that people that don't know the right way. Because maybe that person that you're grilling on social media or the person that you're so angry at in your mind grew up in a home where they weren't loved. Maybe they grew up in a home where their parents were not Christians. Maybe they haven't had the people in your life that you've had to guide you along the way. Maybe they don't know the way. And maybe God is hoping that you could be the one to help to teach them, to help to show them who God is. We need to have the compassion on other people that God had on Nineveh, seeing people as people that need to be taught. And the, the, the last point is that I think it is a good practice every day for us to remember the amazing mercy that God has had on us. And this is what I am going to recommend to you. I recommend that you say a prayer every day. Uh, not just at the dinner table. It doesn't have to be long. It could be long or short. It could be in the morning or in the evening. But every day, make an effort to think about the amazing mercy that God has had for you. The ground is level at the cross. We all need God, God's mercy. On, on the day of judgment, 
We will not be asking for justice. We will be asking for mercy. And we've all been shown incredible mercy. But here's the thing. Don't stop that prayer with just thankfulness for the mercy God has had on you. That's where Jonah stopped. Also thank God for having mercy on those that you have trouble having mercy on. Thank Him for who He is. Thank Him because He is a God of mercy. Brothers and sisters, we have an amazing God. He has shown us incredible, incredible, amazing mercy. And it is good news. It is good news that the whole world, everyone, can benefit from God's mercy if they turn to Him. So we can say positively, we can say with a smiling face that God is merciful and that He's gracious and that He's loving. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.